Small warning, I'm a sugar privileged man. All right, everything has been unveiled for fresh season 2023, safe from the patch notes. I don't have much thoughts for most of the new stuff. I mean, new locker items and drip is always cool. I'm not interested much in playing tabletop battles anyway, but playing tabletop battles online is pretty cool. I agree. It should have been here from the get go, but it's still nice anyway. And not gonna lie, those new cars are cool. We can also pay a few bucks from the jukebox to play our favorite music in the lobby or a private match. I think so. And we finally have a new big run and new King Salmonid, so that's cool. The main thing I'm gonna focus in this video is about the new weapons and the new stage that are coming along in this new season, given that it's essentially the more interesting stuff out of them all, well, save for returning to Incopolis. So let's begin. Starting off with Gal 96 Deco and Kraken Splat Roller, I did not expect Kraken to come back at all, except from another new weapon for this season that's getting a lot of feet right now, you know which one we're talking about. The return of the Kraken is most definitely the biggest surprise and indeed the highlight of this season. This special was very controversial back in the days of Splatoon 1 because it was straight up an invincible special, and it looks like this aspect has not changed at all in Splatoon 3. But as we saw in the last video, it has been reworked and rebalanced a lot to appear more fair and more bearable for the enemy to deal with, at least in my opinion. It's not an instantaneous activation anymore, as there is a small delay between activation and transformation just like Baller or using the ink vac. So technically, you can still kill the enemy in that small activation delay. On the opposite side, you have to watch out and make sure you're safe during that activation delay. On top of that, you can't kill the enemy straight in one hit anymore, as you'll have to hit them twice in order to splat them. There are still instances where you can splat the enemy in one hit, but then involves either the enemy being damaged already or you have to charge a squid surge and charge toward the enemy to kill them. By the way, in that case, you press ZDAR to charge that squid surge and then you release to charge forward. On top of that, the Kraken can be pushed back by shooting at it. You can't splat the Kraken, but that doesn't mean you can't fight back against the Kraken. So unless they charge a squid surge, you can still confront the Kraken head on, but that doesn't mean you should underestimate the Kraken. After all, it's still an invincible special and you'd be better off backtracking a little in most fighting case scenarios until this special runs off. And if you're the one using Kraken and it starts running off indeed, then it will be wiser for you to retreat before returning back to normal or else you risk being finished off by the enemy on the spot, just like Reef Slider. That being said, it was both surprising and not surprising at all to put Kraken back on two classic variants from Splatoon 1. Kraken Splat Roller and Galen 6 Deco were two of the most notorious weapons combined with this special and they've already proven themselves fearsome with their respective kits that are basically kept intact here. Splatoon 3 is really shaping up to be a major throwback to Splatoon 1, not only for the chaos factor and for what made the first game loved by so many in the first place, but also for the many weapons whose kits were pulled straight from the first game, with existing weapons like V-Shot and T-Tech recreating the old T-Tech and Wasabi Splash Shot, Junior, 52, Carbon Deco paying tribute to the OG Vanilla Carbon, Zimi, even the only Squelchers are paying tribute to the OG Jewel Squelcher with its kit. And now Kraken Splat Roller and Gal 96 Deco, as well as another fresh season weapon we're covering next. Though for Splat Roller, the only thing that really changed in between is the ability for rollers to flick vertically in a straight line while in midair. But besides that, Kraken Roller is sure to make a huge splash in its return to glory. Moving on with the weapons that are paired with the new Super Jump Special. The Clash Blaster Neo and the Enza 89 look like they were pulled from Splatoon 2 instead to be paired with a new special that resembles Tenta Missile a lot while having its own characteristics. Regardless, it looks like these weapons will play in a similar fashion to their Splatoon 2 counterparts, as the Clash Blaster Neo will still heavily rely on Crawling Bomb for movement, while the Orange Enza will probably aim for charging and firing Super Jump as many times as necessary. Granted, Super Jump is a bit different from Tenta Missiles, but could prove itself to be equally frightening. And besides, from personal experience, Enza 89 is still a decent offense option with its painting capabilities and its autobomb sub weapon. You should definitely not underestimate this one. Next up with Z plus F charger, how many people are gonna refer to it as 5 in charger anyway? I was expecting this sub and special combo to appear on any other backhand weapon besides chargers like uh, heavy splatting and <sighs> Poor custom jet squelcher. It's not too far fetched for Splat Charger to be paired with a splash wall, as it has always been the case until now. But tripling strike is shaping this weapon to be an overkill backline option that, by the kit alone, is gonna rival the editor for sure. And for good reasons. Especially, the unscoped variant can be played way more aggressively with the charge holding that enables the weapon to come out of cover and shoot at the enemy, while the splash wall offers a good shielding and defensive option against other backline weapons that outrange Splat Charger. And then you fire tripling strike to push them back and reclaim the objective. Any backline with this kit could easily claim the title of anti-backline backline weapon, but Z plus F charger could be fearsome and heavily underestimated by many. Don't know if I can say the same for Z plus F splatter scope, but I do know that in any case we better watch out for Z plus F charger players. Healthy Nozzle Nose D is also aiming to recreate its original Splatoon 1 counterpart, but is prevented from doing so by being paired with Ultra Stamp. The L3 and Burst Bomb combo was proven time and time again to be a fearsome combo, but the Ultra Stamp, hmm, not so much. That does not mean that this special should be looked down upon. It's a special that was introduced late in Splatoon 
Kuchungju's lifespan as a sort of Kraken replacement, so naturally it works pretty similar to Kraken, just not entirely, like Triple Inch Shark and Booyah Bomb. And besides, the special itself can be thrown at the enemy's face. You can still throw it at the face of other e leader or Hydra players, unlike Kraken. It's honestly not a bad special to pair with L3. After all, this special was paired with the Cancel L3, albeit with a different stuff, so I'm most curious as to how this kit is gonna work in the game. For the people that are crying over Rapid Blaster Deco, I must say, this weapon kit is honestly not awful and not very surprising either, given that this variant was also paired with Inkjet back in Splatoon 2. And besides, Torpedo was paired with the Kensa Rapid, so at best you should expect to play this weapon similarly to Kensa Rapid back in Splatoon 2. Inkjet is not too shabby in both offensive and counter-offensive scenarios, but overall this weapon is best played in the mid line. Doesn't shine at all on the front lines, but it doesn't really shine either on the back lines. It's best used for disrupting both lines in various ways. Real threats of Rapid Deco are the other mid laner weapons that can safely take this weapon down from their spot, like Range Blaster, Squeezer, Splash Out Pro, Down 96, or even the next weapon. People are making a fuss about Rapid Deco, but come on, it's not an awful weapon. It has its use and it could be pretty fun to play. Unlike custom Jet Squelcher. Boy, this kid is trash, honestly. I mean, sure, there was a Jet Squelcher with Toxic Mist in Splatoon 2, but people used this weapon to have a decent ranged option while charging Tenda missiles. Not because it had Toxic Mist. And you could find for yourselves some fighting scenarios where you can disrupt the back lines and other mid lines like Rapid Blaster and perhaps even the front lines just like Rapid Deco does with both Toxic Mist and Ink Storm. But nah, this kit is unenjoyable on Jet Squelcher personally. It's better off on a shorter ranged weapon. Custom Jet used to be a more aggro variant. It had a kit that allowed it to shine in other ways than stepping in the back lines. Here we have like two kids sticking to the back lines. That's not for me. I don't have a rational thought for this custom jet squelcher, so I'm gonna cut it short there. Goes to show that if there is shooter privilege, it's justified, trust me. It's not equally applicable to all shooters. I mean, we have Splash at Nova, but that's a different story. Speaking of shooter privilege, oh boy, here we go. Yes, I can agree and certify the hate that Neo Splash Hunt generates for good reasons. It has perfect accuracy, insane painting and fire rate, decent DPS, suction bomb, tripling strike, this weapon has it all, and people are basically upset not just because this update gives a lot more new shooter weapons than, I don't know, brushes, dynamo, h3, splat yolis, splat brellas, stringers or spotanas, but also because they give them the best kits again. Personally, I don't mind, I'm all in for it and I can't wait to get my hands on new splash. But let's take a step back and analyze this weapon. Why on earth would the devs give this weapon a kit scarily similar to Tenetek splash shot if it's gonna end up worse than T-Tech like some claim? After all, T-Tech has more range, more DPS, and it has a much better bomb. Well, first off, splash matic the main weapon, not the vanilla kit, has perks that Splash Shot does not, which makes it play slightly different from Splash Shot, and instead brings it closer to ends up than Splash Shot. Again, it has better painting, faster fire rate, and perfect accuracy at the cost of some range and damage. And besides, you can get more creative with suction bomb kills, and it's a much better sub for tower control. I'd say they're pretty equal, in fact. It only depends on your current needs, until you bring in the fact that it can get special much faster. And admittedly, people are not gonna find it fun to play against a squad of 4 splash matic all variants considered, especially in a tournament setting, but I doubt they'll do that every time. Yes, it's pretty annoying to face 3 T-Techs already, firing multiple triple ink strikes at once, so imagine 4 new splashes. That being said, given that this weapon acts and plays similarly to NZAP and has the same sub as NZAP 85, it also is in direct competition with this weapon. Not just 85, but NZAP 89 as well, because both new splash and NZAP 89 have a bomb and have an offensive special that they can charge fast and spam multiple times. If the devs don't prevent these weapons from chaining specials like they did for 10 missiles, and if Super Chomp ends up just as threatening as 10 missiles, then we're about to face not one, but two 10 missile scenarios at the same time. And I haven't even begun to cover the fact that these two weapons have the power to invalidate so many other specials on their own. Personally, I won't mind. I'm a simple shooter privilege enjoyer. Where are you at, my fellas? I'm pretty excited to get my hands on this weapon, but I know that not everyone else shares my thought and will not enjoy facing this weapon. On the other end, we have Neo Splushomatic, and I was expecting this weapon to receive either Splat Bomb, Point Sensor, or Squid Beacon, which was no surprise in the end, although it's now paired with Killer Whale 5.1. If that doesn't give another reason why Splatoon 3 is a giant throwback to Splatoon 1 besides Kraken, Incopolis Plaza, or the other throwback weapons, I don't know what will. This is basically one such example of shooter privilege not being applicable to all shooters. Historically, Splushomatic always had one variant featuring Squid Beacon, but this variant was always niche, whether it was Splatoon 1 or Splatoon 2. Splush is the shooter with the lowest range, which is compensated by its 
its fire rate and a high DPS. Even so, this weapon had other variants with kits that helped it shine in its own way. Take Splatoon 3's Vanilla Sploosh. It has Curling Bomb that helps the weapon become more mobile and Alter Stem that the weapon can use to wreck Havoc with. Take Sploosh 7 in Splatoon 1. It was paired with an aggressive sub-weapon, the Splat Bomb, and a special, the Inzuka, that gave this weapon an option to fight players out of its reach, like the Backliners. Take even Neo Sploosh from Splatoon 2. It still has Sweet Beacon, which is good to play support and give your teammates some other jumping points, and it had 10 missiles that, again, you could charge fast and spam multiple times, making this weapon more useful on the battlefield. In short, this kit's made up for the weapon's shortcomings and allowed it to shine in a unique way. Sploosh Neo in Splatoon 3 has a kit that's very situational and doesn't allow the weapon to shine compared to some of its peers, starting with Kraken Roller. Uh huh. If you're familiar with playing Sploosh with Squid Beacon in Splatoon 2, I guess you could play it somehow the same way in Splatoon 3, but not entirely. Killer Whale 5.1 doesn't help any weapon shine on its own. It only helps in pressuring the enemy and finish them off. It just doesn't make up for any weapon's shortcomings. I could use many more examples, like Gal 52, but it's getting clear that this weapon is gonna be rapidly eclipsed, unfortunately. Last but not least, we have Tri Slasher with Fizzy Bomb and Tacticaler. It's not what I would expect, but honestly, it's a nice kit, and it definitely screams Soda more than Soda Slasher. <laughs> Fizzy Bomb is a nice sub that pairs well with weapons like Luna Blaster Neo or even Slashing Machine, so no doubt this sub is gonna play very fine with Tri Slasher. And besides, you do not want to underestimate Tacticaler at all. That's pretty much it for the new weapons. Now let's take a look at the new Desert Stage, Umami Ruins. I like the fact they use Umami as the pun, they even used Nam Pla in Japanese. It seems to be yet again a pretty small map with one single main path and little to no flanking options from the looks of it. The platform at the far end of the map seems to be the enemy spawn point, and from the way the camera pans down on the whole stage, we can assume we are looking at the stage from the perspective of the allied spawn point. The spawn branches out between the main path, a right wing that serves as a snapping point to push back the enemy who might be progressing too far with the objective, and a left wing that leads to a small pit with an ink rail that leads to the left of mid that unfortunately can be easily spotted by the enemy backliner from this sniping spot, invalidating this flanking option, unless the player hides behind that block in time. The player has the option to stand on that small platform that serves as another sniping point to push back the enemy on the objective or progress through this pit and get to mid without using the ink rail. These blocks are most likely here to prevent backliner from barring access to mid by this path. I also noticed that this lab of whatever this is being hung over from a crane is also partially blocking the view of backliners, forcing them to move to this crate on the right. This gives backliners a better overview of mid without looking at the enemy pit area, but the trade-off is that it's not an ideal spot to move away from if the enemy is starting to attack backliners, so keep that in mind. The middle of the map is a fairly open-ended circular area with multiple blocks, with the low elevated platform in the middle serving as the centerpiece. I cannot deduce if this is an uninkable ramp that gives us access to the enemy snipe on foot, but that's a pretty insane path option if that's true. Now keep in mind on this image we're probably looking at the main version for Turf War, as the layout is subject to change with other game modes. Either way, we can pretty easily deduce how the map is gonna turn out with the different anarchy game modes. Splat zones could go two ways. Either we have one splat zone on the center platform, or two separate splat zones on the sides. Naturally, the block in the middle will disappear and make way for the rainmaker or the tower. If we're going for three checkpoints in tower control, I suppose the tower would move on the side, away from the enemy snipe, before stopping at the first checkpoint right there. Once the tower passes this checkpoint, it will move towards the main path that leads to mid, stopping at where this block stands in order to pass checkpoint number two. Once the tower gets through, it will most likely move towards the this block for checkpoint number 3 before moving on to the finish point, which would be placed right underneath the spawn point. In a similar fashion, the Rainmaker should be taking the same path, with the checkpoint placed at the end of the main path to mid and the goal placed below spawn again. Finally, I assume the clam basket would be placed at this point right below this ledge, which is a perfect spot placed between spawn and mid where all the clams will appear, with a few clams eventually spawning on the path in front of the basket or even in the pit below. Besides the whole majestic archaeological area setting, the map was already criticized for being too simple stick in design, even looking like a Tetris block again, which got players concerned for future map designs as they praised the more complex, more layered and more intricate designs of older maps. Take Museum D'Alfonsino, Wild World, Inkblot Art Academy, or even Scorch Gorge for instance. Yes, Scorch Gorge counts, you'll see why. These maps have the players run through a long path in a non-linear fashion, understand not going to mid in a straight line, before getting to mid, with multiple path options to engage on mid, including getting from behind. That's called flanking right there. These maps are praised by the community for the more complex design that allows for multiple kinds of plays and ways to engage in battle, as opposed to the more simplistic and predictable approach of map design like Eeltail Alley, Hagglefish Market, Brinewater Springs or even... <sighs>
What have they done to my my resort in Hammerhead Bridge? I could say that this simplistic approach only works in Brightwater Springs because this oversimplification is what makes all the charm of this map. It's just go down your ramp to mid, there are pits down below, and that's it. But the same cannot be said for other maps, especially Hammerhead Bridge and my my resort. My my used to be much bigger, and you could progress to mid through two ways: the right off spawn, a straight road down before turning left on snipe to get to mid, or take the platforms to the left of spawn to either join mid or flank the enemy snipe by going further left. Now it's just one main straight road towards mid. Left, right, doesn't matter. That's it. Hammerhead Bridge used to have a top road, a giant long grate that leads to the center platform, and a bottom section with tons of construction material that serves as obstacles, walls, and platforms. I get that lore-wise it makes sense for Hammerhead Bridge to have completed construction, but the map is barely recognizable now. The bottom section has been built up and filled up, and all that remains is the top road that's entirely solid now, with some constructs vaguely reminiscent of the construction materials that were used as platforms. The only thing that's remotely recognizable from this map is the path to left snipe has mostly been spared from changes for the most part. But the fact remains, these maps were simplified and changed for the worse. Old maps that were once beloved by the players are left unrecognizable and now despised. And the new maps with designs that are too simple and predictable are equally despised because of that approach. We want more complex and exciting map designs. Even Manta Maria has at least three paths towards mid, one of them literally being a flank. Hear us out, Nogami. Anyway, that's gonna be it for my thoughts on the new weapons and the new stage for Fresh Season 2023. I hope you guys enjoyed this video, let me know your thoughts about Fresh Season 2023, hit the like button, subscribe, turn on notifications, and make sure to stick around for the upcoming patch notes. This was Starless Sonic, and I'll see you next time, peace!